I'm Frank Horvath. This is Dennis Patterson, audio engineer. Uh, we are coming to you live right now from Dennis's uh, home studio. We're talking about uh, my albums coming out. Uh, four albums in four days are being released, so it's a little bit of a celebration, and it only feels right to be chatting with a lot of the people um, that made these albums possible. So Dennis is definitely part of that uh, party. Um, so a lot of you who are in the Toronto music community might know Dennis from um, from his CBC days, um, where he worked in, intensely um, as a recording engineer, audio engineer there. Um, right now he's um, doing the freelance thing um, yeah. under the under the auspices of Big Smoke Audio. Um, he does a lot of mixing, mastering, audio editing, um, location recording. That's a big yeah. thing in your life, yeah. too. All the time. Um, so that's pretty cool. You've worked on projects that have been either nominated or won Junos, Grammys, Genies, Oscars. I read your bio. So yeah. you are quite awesome. So well, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you for being here. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. And the reason why you're directly part of um, the making of these albums is because Dennis mastered three of the four albums. Thanks for uh, letting me be a part of this and um, I just want to say how how bold and uh, awesome it is that you're releasing all four records at once. I think that's amazing. <laughs> well, um, some people would yeah, say it's so, crazy. so but... prolific and you put <laughs> no, no. so much music. I mean, this is fantastic. Oh, and, man. And great music too, by the way. Dennis, um, I'm going to sort of put you on a spot about regarding sure. mastering. Is mastering a dying art? that is becoming irrelevant with the, because of the way people are consuming music? Or is it even more important than ever? I think um, the answer would be yes and no. One, the yes <laughs> being nice. that, or the, excuse me, the no being that um, it's more important than ever uh, to have something that's polished and, and put into uh, a perspective for people to listen to. Um, because there's so many different platforms that we can listen on now, whether it's, uh, you know, we're streaming to Bluetooth speakers somewhere in our home or uh, playing an MP3 from a car or, or listening to a streaming service while you're walking down the street, um, to have like a, a professionally uh, packaged listening experience is very important, I think, now. Um, the other side of that is that with the development of AI, there's... Uh, um, online mastering services now that I don't know that people are using them directly for their uh, for their releases, but they may be, and I know that they are using them for demos and certain things like that that get you in the ballpark pretty fast and pretty pretty cheaply without a human ever touching it. So I think the human mastering right. might be going uh, away somewhat, but again. Like all things with, that are being replaced by AI, things that are maybe higher art uh, are are not going to be replaced as quickly. How is it? How is it to master an album, a more pop band oriented album, singer songwriter sure, album, sure, yeah. versus mastering a classical recording? Yeah, completely different. After the after you sequence it and drop the IDs, uh, the pop record, you know, up until you know recently. The louder, the better. You clip the output of uh, uh, or input of the converters to try and get something uh, that you could squeak out one more dB of volume. Whereas in uh, new music or classical music, you're 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 trying to have a uh, a more unadulterated listening experience where the dynamics speak truly. Um, but that's what we're trying to portray. What we really want is this hyper-realism in the dynamics, so we don't have to go and turn the music up, whereas in some instances live, it just wouldn't be loud enough to hear properly, right? right? Um, I always find it interesting when you get to the mastering stage for a solo piano yeah. album, because I always often find that, you, you know, usually the, the big work in the recording process is yeah. mixing and editing, right? Definitely. And that was definitely the case for Current Agenda and uh, Me to We. 
but it's almost like it's reversed for like a solo piano album. And it's because I remember you and I, yeah. back when I was here for the mastering sessions, we were talking a lot about, well, how do we want people to hear this piano album? Yeah. Do, we want, do we want them to feel like their head is stuck inside the piano, or are they sitting in the back of a sure, reverberant sure. hall, yeah. you know, and you are going to expose through the, uh, you know, through the EQ yeah. and, and the manipulation of that and some filters and stuff, you're going to, you know, give the listener that feeling. So how much of that is a, a big thing um, when you're dealing with um, acoustic instruments, especially in the classical right. realm where it's all about the ambience of the sound? Sure, yeah. sure. I think it's, it's you have more opportunity to, to be more effective or to have a, a, a greater effect over the overall perception when it's a solo instrument. Um, that you're mastering because you can do almost as much as you could when you were mixing. Right. Um, but having said that, you can only work with what you've got at the same time Absolutely. and you deliver great sounding tracks um, performance wise, acoustically, the piano sounded great, it was recorded fantastically. Um, a really good job at, at Canterbury with Julian. and. Uh, you know, I, I think that you're just given the extra opportunity to go in and change the acoustic that it was in, if you right. want to, or, or change the bass or something like that. Whereas with a, a full mix of a, a band, you're affecting different instruments not equally. You're affecting right. them differently when you apply different processing to them. So I really think you're allowed another... Uh, decision right. with solo instrument. If people want to know, do I have a successful master here or not? Well, it's like the uh, cooking show or the you know the the home renovation show, the before and the after. Yeah, right? yeah. If you can you can definitely hear it. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because I remember when we started. You're saying you know I'm not gonna not gonna do much. There's not gonna be a lot of difference with the sound. And and I should do a quick shout out by the way to, sure. um, to Peter Letros. Um, Peter um, mastered the fourth album oh, yeah. that's coming out on Thursday, Love and Six yeah. Stages. So, um, and he said the exact same thing you did right. before he started <laughs> his work, you know. And, and it's, it's amazing because I listened to the four albums and I remember what the final mix is sound like, the pre-mastered. Sure. And it's like, it's, it's, for me, it's sort of like walking into a room and there's a room and it's painted and stuff, but... You know, but then you walk into that room and it's freshly painted. Yeah, and it yeah. gives you that same feeling, like, yeah. oh my gosh, it's so much more vivid and bright yeah, when you're vivid here. And, yeah. and yeah, and polished and and any little little things that I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you're doing on the sessions and in the mix that you know you need to whether it be time or or whatever the the reason you need to, to get it done and. Just having a, a, a separate set of ears uh, in those circumstances kind of helps. You know, you can't spend uh, too much time rethinking decisions during mixing. Yeah. That that takes out absolutely all the energy out of a mix. To me, is just going. You have to commit yourself to decisions, and then a separate set of ears to listen afterwards is always a a great idea. Not that. Uh, some some mixers can't master their own stuff. They can, but uh, I think there's a great benefit just to having someone who doesn't have any baggage from the yeah. from the recording or the mix have a fresh uh, yeah. once over with it. Anyways, objectivity. So, yeah, basically listening yeah. objectivity. I, I'm just like I. You, your ears will want to adjust to something that's not quite right. It's just yeah. a natural human thing. Yeah, you and it happens not avoid fast. It. Yeah, and so it you does have to yeah. make your decisions quickly going into it. That's I, for sure. I find like when I'm at home and I'm doing some quick mixes and stuff for like little film TV cues mm -hmm. that I'm working on that I'm just shopping up to libraries and stuff. I find that wow, it's like the more if I listen the next morning. Yeah, it's like how the heck did I miss that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's just like yeah. it's so blatant. Why? Because I gave my ears a chance to sure, you know, yeah, fresh ears, fresh and ears. fresh perspective, and and even just another listen of a. Ma I try and and always have another listen of a master after the day I've worked on it to uh, yeah to was I really was I too <laughs> tired then or was I on top of it? You know, you just want to yeah. be sure. Let's talk about some of the sort of the highlights or lowlights or whatever of the music that we worked on. Because I subjected you to a, a 
crap load of music yeah, all in one it was shot. A lot. Now, I guess not a lot. A lot of people come in and say, "Hi, here, let's master three albums in a row," and yeah. that's exactly what we did, right? Yeah. And I remember when we were doing the mastering sessions, it was like you would work on one for a little while, and then it's like, "Okay, let's take a break," and then you would switch. Yeah, and we were switching. A yeah, lot I found it difficult to get my head around the different um, the different albums and to keep them as separate things, and not to get too far into. Uh, Kind of the sonic world of one, yeah, and then Rub try the and other. pull that one into the other one, which it didn't fit in. It, it, yeah. it was real, a real uh, uh, challenge to keep perspective on each one when working on all three, as we did. So, is there any of the is any particular albums that sort of caught your eye, or either like engineering wise or compositionally, um, that was sort of interesting for you, or they're they're all interesting and fit my listening at different times. I think the one that that kind of grabs me the quickest is the current agenda, mm. um, and maybe that's uh, you know it's a little more aggressive sounding in a lot of ways. Right, a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but has so many it has so so many layers. And it's probably because it's got uh, playback and and electronics and things in it that, that grab my ear um, because maybe I haven't heard them that way before. Um, but that's not to say that there's not a, a depth in the solo piano pieces either. That I, I just find like just the instrument is so complex harmonically that you can just you can always find new interesting sounds in a solo piano record to me. Wait, listen, yeah. thank you so much, Dennis. Thank Dennis you. Patterson. Congratulations. It, thank you very much. It's yeah. very exciting. Um, and thank you for being a, such a big part of it and basically giving the three of the four recordings its beautiful final change. Oh, I'm, I'm very happy about that. So Dennis Patterson, Big Smoke Audio.